Well, good morning and welcome to today's crop hour session. My name is Connie Strunk and I'm a plant pathology field specialist and I will be your host and moderator today and this week. Today is the start of our 2023 crop hour presentation. And so we're so excited that you have logged in to hear what our speakers have to say. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. You can follow along with the slides. You'll see upcoming sessions. Um, we'll have some different instructions kind of throughout today's presentation. But if at any time you have a question, please you know, feel free to either raise a hand with the little icon at the bottom of your screen or type your question into the chat or Q&A feature here in Zoom and we'll get those questions addressed as soon as we're able to. Um, we do have CCA credits available for those that are in need of them. It'll be you know, one QR code that will show that will only be shown once. So be sure when it's when we show that QR code that you have your phone or other apparatus ready to grab that QR code to submit that. Um, the certified credit advisor app um, will be able to let you do that. Again, that'll only be shown once. If you're watching from a recording, it will not be available to you. If you have any technical difficulties, you know, feel free again to send us a chat or raise your hand. With that, I'd like to again welcome you to today's crop hour and introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker will be Phil Roseboom. He is works with entomology and our as an IPM coordinator. And Phil will be talking about managing rootworms and some other pesty problems within corn. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Phil. All right. Thank you, Connie. Uh, hopefully you can see my my slides up and hear me just fine. Uh, so like Connie said, um, the majority of the talk will be about corn root runs, but we will be covering five other insects of concern for corn. Um, like she said, I'm Philip Rosebaum. I'm the IPM coordinator, started that position in 2018. Uh, before that, I was um, that third or second name there, Dr. Adam Varenhorst. He's my supervisor. I was his field tech. Um, and I, I continue to be his field tech, so I do, um, I run and put together all of his field research. Uh, and then that last name there is Patrick Wagner. He's basically the entomologist based out of Rapid City, um, and he, he handles a lot of those insects, field crop insects, on the west side of the state. Uh, so with that, let's get started. All right, so our first insect that we'll cover, and this is one we'll cover the most in-depth, is our corn rootworm. Um, there's two different species of concern um, in our cornfields. Uh, the first one being our northern corn rootworm. Um, the adults as seen here are the ones that uh, they rarely cause economic damage. And I'll show an example of when they do cause damage. Um, but the majority of damage is done by your larvae, and they feed on those corn roots, and that causes uh, multiple different problems. Um, but this northern corn rootworm, as you can see on the slide here, there is they're quite small, they're little green beetles, but they do vary in color. Uh, so you have that bright green to yellow color. Uh, the next species of corn rootworm, the western corn rootworm, um, exact same thing, adults rarely cause damage. Uh, it's all the larvae feeding on the corn roots. Uh, and in here you can see a color gradient as well. Most of the time, they're like on the left there, where they're uh, dark yellow with black lines, but those black lines merge together, forming mostly black back, as you can see on the right there. So the life cycle is important to know for your rootworms and when they appear and when most of the damage is done. Uh, so at the top, you can see your different months, um, and then at the bottom, um, you can see some pictures and demonstrations. And if you, you'll notice the larvae, they appear loosely from around early June to mid-August. Um, and then as they feed on your quartz, they will pupate and become adults. And then adults are loosely seen in your cornfield from mid-July all the way through um, the end of October. Um, but keep in mind that larva picture at the very bottom, that's where most, if not all, damage occurs. Um, from June to mid-August. Uh, so to with IPM and insects, it's very important to scout your field to know what's out there and, you know, diseases as well. Um, as well, you got to know what's out in your field so you know what to treat when to treat. 
Um, with the cornworm, there's two different scouting methods. First one here is very labor intensive. Um, and this is what uh, a lot of researchers will do um, because you get a lot of data from it. Um, but the first scouting method, you're looking at your larval injury. And from that uh, life cycle uh, that I showed you earlier, that's the larval injury is loosely from July, August. What you do is you dig up your corn roots. Um, you wash those roots to remove all that soil to expose those roots. Uh, and then you examine the root nodes four or five mix uh, for feeding days from those corn rootworm larvae. Uh, six uh, nodes is below the BRAC roots for reference. So there is a picture taken um, by Dr. Rice uh, quite a few years ago, but the one on the left um, has just you know slight damage. There is a little bit of damage to that. The one on the right, you can see it's severely damaged. That, that's when you have a very severe infestation of corn larva. So when you look at, at this picture here, there is a rating scale of one to three, um, or sorry, zero to three. Uh, node injury scale of zero. There is no apparent uh, feeding damage. So as you can see on that, it's a relatively small picture, but you can see there are a lot of um, roots there. There's there's no damage at all. It's a very healthy corn plant. Uh, node injury scale rating of 1 to 1 1.9. Um, there is at least one full node destroyed uh, within 1.5 inches of the stock uh, so that you can see that 1.5 rating um, right at the top of, of the first root there. And then you can see, um, you know, there's relatively severe damage to that. Uh, symptoms from uh, mild damage like this, you will have some lodging and some goose necking. Uh, yield impact, um, there will be some economic loss to your grain or silage, uh, unless, you know, there is a lot of uh, that, that plant is able to regrow. Um, so like a really wet year, that will help with that. Um, but also note that uh, that regrowth can obscure some damage. So take care when you're rating roots later on in the season to account for that. Um, so for reference, a rating of one out of zero to three uh, can be a 15% yield loss. Uh, so even though it's a, you know, low on the scale, that's still 15% yield loss. Um, a yield rating of three, so the, the max amount, that's a 45% yield loss. Nearly half a percent of your yield is lost. Um, and there's a little note there in parentheses, so a node rating scale of three for BT BT corn, if you have BT corn and you see this, that is a, resign, uh, a sign of resistance. And if you do see something like that, please contact me or uh, Adam and let us know because we'll definitely come out and take a look at that. And with this, two or more nodes are completely gone. With this, since there are no roots on that corn plant, you will have severe lodging and goose, goosenecking. Um, and most likely you, you're going to see a lot of those adults um, feeding on your leaves in silk. So if if you recall earlier, I said adults rarely cause economic uh, damage. Um, when you have enough of them, they will feed on your leaves in silk. So that's when they can uh, cause damage. Yield impact severe, as seen in the top right there, 45% yield loss, loss in grain, additional uh, poor ear fill, and then uh, your silks can be fed on by those by those adults. And it can be hard to harvest them because of that severe lodging. So that's the very first method of scouting. Again, that's the most labor intensive by far. Uh, the second one, uh, you're just looking at adult populations from July to August. This scouting method, it's not the best because in this case, you're looking at the adults and uh, all your damage has already been done by those larvae. Um, but you can place out yellow sticky cards. There's a demonstration there, picture taken by uh, Dr. Dunbar. Um, you want to replace those weekly. And you go out, if you have two adults per card, you're at threshold, and you might want to think about applying a foliar treatment if possible. Or, or just keep that in mind for next year. You know, rotate to a different crop or uh, use a insecticide or a different BT trait um, to hopefully try to manage them. So as I just mentioned, uh, you're scouting for next year's management. Um, so when you dig roots, you know, and you st in, if you dig roots early enough and you see slight damage, you might be able to do something about it. Um, but in most cases, if you already see that damage or if you already see those adults in your field, the damage has already occurred. 
Um, so here's a, a picture taken by Dr. Dunbar of severe lodging. Um, you know, that, that causes uh, uh, really hard to harvest that stuff later. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you can see um, some goosenecking, but also that stunted uh, ear of corn there. And that's all caused by that corn rootworm. So there are no rescue treatments. You know, the larva, if they feed on your roots, um, that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. But you can, you can manage those adults if they're severe enough. So here's a picture of your northern corn rootworm uh, feeding on that corn ear. And if you do see that, you know, the threshold is two. So obviously they're way above that. That's when you want to uh, think about applying a, a treatment to control them. And that would be killing those adults so you don't have nearly as or you don't have a severe infestation next year. So corn rootworm management. Um, there are some, uh, with BT, there are some things to avoid. So if you have a corn hybrid that only has a single gene that, uh, you know, deters feeding on, on that corn plant, uh, try to avoid that. Um, you want ones with multiple genes in it that um, resist that, that uh, corn rootworm. Also, um, try to avoid hybrids containing only, so a single gene, CRY3BB1, CRY3435, AB1, or E cry 3.1 AB. If your hybrid only has one of these, um, uh, you know, think about using something else or using inferior treatment because there is uh, some resistance to uh, just one of these. If you have a hybrid that has all three, then you're most likely okay because that's that's uh, more than one gene uh, offering resistance to those uh, corn rootworm. Um, there are some options. Um, so it says here, as of March 2022, this comes from the handy BT trait table, and that comes from Michigan State University. They update uh, every March. So, you know, March 2023 hasn't happened, obviously, so it will be updated this coming March. Um, but they list all your different BT traits, um, a very helpful um, website. So if you want to get to that, just search Michigan State handy BT trait table. Um, and here's two traits, um, MCRI3A and then that DVS NF7 DSRNA. Um, those two traits in combinations with others um, are very useful um, CRI or BT traits to use against um, your corn and rootworm. And then here's the uh, brand name SmartStacks Pro with RNA, RNAi technology. And then there's the list of the CRI genes there or uh, Acre, Acremax Extreme. AgriSure 3122 Easy Refuge and Intersect Extreme and QROM. Uh, these are products that are recommended by Michigan State uh, to control your corn rootworm. And keep in mind that's from March of last year. This will be updated uh, this coming March. So that was your corn rootworm. We'll now move on to our second insect, insect out of six. Uh, the first one being your Euro European corn borer. Uh, the larvae here on the left, taken by um, peers there, they have three pairs of true legs, so that'll be up in the front, and four pairs of pro legs. Those are in the rear of the insect. They're more suction cup-like. Your true legs are piercing-like. They're very sharp, made for um, uh, better gripping. Um, we only mention the legs because you can ID larvae based on those characteristics, and we do have a corn uh, pest handout publication um uh that that uses that as a descriptor um color wise it's light tan body with dark brown spots you can see that on that picture throughout and then a dark bread head cap dark brown head capsule uh picture on the left is your two different adults uh so the one on the left your dark brown is your male species or male adult and the one on the right is your um white your female when you're scouting, you know, you can look for the adults, but you want to look for that uh, larva more because that's those are that's the life stage that causes the most damage. Uh, so some damage to look for on your leaves um, is the shot hole injury. And what that is, is and the window pane injury is when those larvae are young. Um, the shot hole injury, they'll feed on a unfurled leaf. So it's still curled up. So it's still one hole at that point. They chew through that, that curled up leaf. And then when that leaf unfurls, uh, you get that shot hole uh, injury appearance. The window pane injury that's caused by a, a younger larva as well. They can't chew through the leaf because, you know, a corn leaf is very tough. 
they'll just skim the surface of that leaf and cause that window pane injury. Um, so that European corn borer larva uh, in the later in later stages will go into the stalk of that corn. Um, so if you don't want to, you know, chop down your corn plant and look in that stock, you can look for these two indicators that you have European corn borer in your corn field. Uh, so scouting for European corn borer, um, you can use a de degree day accumulation um, calculations um, based on the capture of the first spring moth and the accumulated degree days after that. You can kind of predict based on those two factors uh, when you'll see um, larva and what type of damage you'll see. Um, and if you look at the very bottom of the slide, the extension to sdstate.edu, um, we do put out a pest and crop newsletter uh, during the uh, uh, growing season every Monday. And Adam will calculate those accumulated degree days and put an article out every Monday um, to keep you guys updated, you know, where we are and when, what to expect out in your field at that time. So accumulated degree days, it's a calculation of average temperature um, minus your development threshold. So that average temperature is your high temp minus your low temp divided by two. Um, and every insect has a different developmental threshold. The European corn borer is 10 degrees Celsius. Um, so with that calculation, we can um, figure out the accumulated degree, degree days for that um, insect. So here's a, a chart that we use when we uh, put out those publications. So here's a first generation European corn borer. Uh, that first occurrence accu accumulated degree day zero is that first spring moth when you find it. Um, approximately 16.3 days later or 212 de degree days, you'll have your first instar, your larval hatch, and your general activity will be uh, that pinhole leaf feeding. Um, approximately 6.6 .6 days later, you'll have your second instar, and that'll be around 318 degree days. You'll have shot hole feeding, um, and then so on and so forth, you know, 6.5, third instar, 435 degree days, mid rib and stock boring. Um, the fourth instar, you'll have stock boring, fifth instar, uh, stock boring. Um, those larvae will come out, they'll pupate, change into an adult. Um, around 1,002 um, accumulated degree days. Um, here's a second chart. Uh, you There are two generations of European corn borer per year. Um, so after that first generation pupates and becomes adult, you can have that uh, second generation. Uh, so that second generation, you'll have pollen and leaf axle feeding. Those larvae will eat that. Leaf axle feeding on the second instar around uh, 1,510 degree days. Um, and so on and so forth, that fifth and star, you know, stock boring around 1,984. Um, so again, I'll reference that pest and crop newsletter. We will put out articles telling um, you to ex um, what degree days around we're at. And you can use information like this to kind of uh, see what general activity you should be looking for, scouting for, um, and, you know, the progression of that of the European corn borer in your cornfield, if you have them. So scouting for European corn borer, it's relatively labor intensive. You wanna examine a hundred plants per field per sampling date. So uh, five different sets of 20 plants each. So you wanna sample 20 or five sites in your field, 20 plants at each site. Um, record the percentage of rural feeding um, dissect two damaged plants and set record total of larva. And you want to know the life stage of that larva too. Um, and that's instar. Generally, your first instar is a very small larva. Um, all the way up to the fifth instar, there'll be that, uh, that picture I showed you earlier. That's the late life stage, late instar of larva when they're big. So making management decisions, there is a sheet um, as you can see in the bottom there from the University of Illinois, where you can calculate whether you should apply treatment to your corn field. Um, I won't go through the whole thing uh, just for time wise, but you start at the top left, you have your larva found times your expected survival. Um, and if you look at number two in those notes, 
If larvae are newly hatched, so that first instar, they're really tiny, it is likely that only 20% will survive uh, to maturity. So in the ex expected survival, you put 0.2. Uh, so you take your number of larvae found times 0.2, and you get surviving larvae. Um, you then put surviving larvae on that next uh, step there, divided by plants examined. So let's say 100 plants, that equals larva per plant. Um, and so on and so far, flavor per plant, yield loss, and you just move down that sheet until you get to the last bottom right on the table there. Um, and you can see, you know, will you gain or lose uh, money based on uh, acres applied, treatment applied? Um, so again, for reference, that's from the University of Illinois if you, you, know, you want to download or print the sheet for, for use. So management, um, don't plant your corn first or last in the neighborhood. Uh, reason being, um, if you're very first or very last, you're more susceptible to infestation because you're kind of like a trap crop. Um, harvest your infested fields early. So if you do have your European corn borer in your field, you want to get out there before that corn lodges. Um, otherwise, you know, you're going to have a real hard time getting to it. Um, and then also don't till your field in the fall. Leave those stalks above the soil. Um, reason being that larva will uh, overwinter in that stock, and of course, if it gets cold enough, um, it can kill those larva in that stock. Uh, so we generally recommend not tilling your cornfield. So management foliar insecticides. Um, this is tough because you have to treat at the right time. Um, you must treat while majority of the larva are in the whirl, so those young uh, larva up in the whirl. Um, Again, that's hard to do unless you go out and scout your field, you know, probably a couple couple days per week just to keep an eye on them. Um, so not not easy to do. Um, and then some recommended insecticide classes for your European corn borer. There are some organophosphates that are still legal and of course uh, pyrethroids. So our next pass is your common stock borer. Um, you can see a really good side picture here. Three pairs of true legs. Those are the ones on the left with the sharp points. And then four pairs of pro legs. Those are the small suction cup legs kind of in the middle middle right section. Uh, they have a purple saddle on the abdomen, as you can see on the right there, and then a black stripe on each side of, of the orange head as seen on the left. Uh, and these guys are usually quite a bit smaller than your European corn borer as well. So they feed on the leaves and they tunnel into the stalks, uh, more typical around your field uh, borders. Um, so that you won't typically find them deeper into your field. Uh, and then of course your younger corn is more susceptible. European corn borer, you know, they bore into the stock. It's more of a late season. Um, in this case, the stock borer is more common, more damaging in your younger corn. Scouting for these guys, you wanna do it from May to June. Um, scout 30 random plants in the border rows. Um, so, you know, quite a bit less than your European corn border where you want to do 100. This one, you only look at 30 random plants throughout your border rows. And here's a picture of, of some damage there. You can see that larva uh, in that whirl there on the right. So here's economic threshold. It, it's a dynamic threshold. Um, I won't go through the whole thing, but you can see... Um, the uh, percentage of infested plants, there's all those numbers there for that. And based off your $5 bushel um, and then your projected yield, 150, uh, 175, 200, 225, and so on. Um, based on those 30 plants, you know, if you have 2.89 at $6 corn at 150 yield uh, and you get 2.89 um, percentage, that's when you want to think about applying. Um, so just for reference, I'm sure you can pull this table up if you need to um, from, from uh, you know, an article that, that we put out. But it is a dynamic threshold for these guys for corn. So management, um, remove your weeds around the borders prior to corn emergence. They do overwinter in that the, those weeds on your field margins. Um, do not manage your field borders immediately after corn emergence. Um, that is because those larvae, they emerge out of that, you know, the, the ditches, the weeds, and they crawl into your corn. Uh, so you want to apply your fir for first four to six rows of your corn 
uh, while those larvae are moving from the that weedy area into your the edge of your corn. Our next larva is your black cutworm, and you can see here they have three pairs of true legs in the front, four pairs of pro legs in that uh, middle right section there. Skin has a rough texture to it, and they vary in color from dark brown to black. Um, typically, they do kind of have a white uh, line uh, right along the their sides, right by their legs. Um, so black cutworm, the adults migrate from the southern U.S. Early, um, in the early spring. So depending on your weather patterns and stuff, um, that will decide whether the adults make it up or not. The female moths are attracted to wet, weedy fields. Um, so, you know, try to manage your weeds as best you can. Um, begin scouting at emergence and continue through V4. Um, examine 20 plants throughout your whole field and manage if 5% of your seedlings are cut or have a leaf feeding. Uh, so here's a picture of a corn plant that was cut by um, the black cutworm. They literally cut right at the base of that corn plant and it just kind of flops over. Um, keep in mind, we have had um, cutworm in our cornfields at Volga, um, but also damage kind of sometimes appears like a, a deer will come out and eat some of our corn plants. Um, so keep that in mind. Management, you can use BT corn hybrids that express CRY1F that uh, can be used for black cutworm. And then, of course, uh, you can use foliar insecticides applied late in the day. Uh, that's uh, It says applied late in the day because those black cutworm, they are nocturnal. Those larvae come out uh, when it's dark out or you know late in the evening. Uh, so make sure if you do apply for that, make sure you do that late in the day because uh, that's when they're active in your field. Our next insect, uh, these are, of course, a problem in corn, but they're generalists. They're a problem in everything. They were an issue in 21 and 22. Uh, 2022 was less favorable uh, for them. They overwinter in the soil, um, but 2022 was still dry. And of course, 21 was dr pretty dry as well. Uh, grasshoppers thrive in drier climates. Uh, here's a picture of 2020 near Dakota Lakes. It's I know it's not a cornfield, but it's our um, one of our sunflower research plots. They basically ate every single leaf of that sunflower field um, entirely. Um, so it was a spray trial for red sunflower seed weevil, but of course we couldn't do the trial at all because they just hit that field so hard. Uh, so you can see they're, here they're eating that sunflower head as well. Um, if you know sunflower, that stuff is even more... Uh, their leaves and stems are even more rough than a corn plant. Um, so it was surprising to see that. Uh, prediction for grasshoppers, you know, we had drought in 21, 22 in areas. Um, uh, 2022, we had an earlier frost than 2021. Um, but based on those factors and just the amount of grasshoppers we saw throughout in 2022, um, we we're likely to see large populations in 2023. Um, and depending on spring conditions, they may be early. So if it's relatively warm out earlier, um, those grasshoppers will emerge. And, you know, just keep an eye on your cornfield or whatever crop you're growing, because they will clean cut that field if they're severe enough. Those nymphs will come out and just eat whatever they can find. Uh, grasshopper thresholds. Um, there's two different thresholds based on what you have. 8 to 14 adults per square yard, and it's a gradient 8 to 14 because uh, grasshoppers that are highly mobile. Um, so, you know, try to count them as best you can. Visualize a square yard. If you're in, in between 8 and 14, it's time to treat. Uh, nymphs, it's a higher threshold because they're smaller, so they eat less. It's 30 to 45 nymphs per square yard. Um, a corn specific, specific thresholds. If your silks are clipped within a half inch of the tip of the husk, it's time to treat those grasshoppers. Um, or in when pollination is less than 50% complete, um, that you might want to think about a foliar insecticide. Uh, our last insect here, red-headed flea beetles, they show up in July. Um, and they have a dark red head with a black body as seen there, and they can jump long distances, hence their name, flea beetle. You can kind of see in the picture here, their rear legs, um, they're kind of curled up underneath their body, um, and they use that to, you know, jump away from danger, and they, they do jump very far. So they feed on the leaves, leaving small holes as seen here. Um, you can see 
um basically that flea beetle is is uh eating the the basically the tip of that corn plant um but they all will also uh clip your silks uh later on in the season uh the threshold for them is five beetles or more per ear um and then just like the grasshopper um if they're the silks are clipped between a half inch of the tip of the husk and pollination less is less than 50 percent complete uh, you might want to uh, think about a foliar insecticide. Um, typically, uh, these guys haven't been an issue, um, but it's always something to keep an eye out for. Uh, so with that, here's some um, required slides we need to show. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, you can email me at philip.rosefoam at sdstate.edu if you have any questions. Um, Typically, Adam takes most of the questions. You can see his office number there, 605-688-6854, uh, and then his email address. And then as I mentioned, kind of in the middle of the presentation, visit our website, extension.sdstate.edu, um, and sign up for the Pest and Crop Newsletter, because as I mentioned before, uh, we'll put out articles every Monday um, that are based on the previous week. So if we see an insect uh, causing issues, we'll put an article about it. Um, so if you want to stay up to date and, you know, know what to look for throughout the year, um, definitely subscribe to that newsletter. So with that, are there any questions? <laughs>